welcome to Healthy Living. I'm Debbie Lyons. I'm here today with Kelly Presnell, Director of Public Relations here at the mm -hmm. hospital. And we're excited. We've got a great young woman we're talking to today. Yes, uh, Carrie Mao. She's a nurse practitioner specializing in breast health and, and women's health in general who has started with us in the Breast Health Center to complement the team that we have um, in our wonderful Breast Health Center. So she's, you know, she's young, excited, lots of experience um, from OB, women's health to mm -hmm. breast health. So it's a great compliment to the team that we have up there. I've actually met her and she is so impressive. Mm -hmm. So I look forward to interviewing him, interviewing her. her. Uh -huh. right. Excuse me. Hi, can I get through, please? <laughs> you know, there has to be a better way. A way to skip the ER waiting room. Like this lady over here. All she did was log on to inquicker.com to hold her son's place in line. Now they can wait at home and skip the ER waiting room. Now, which would you choose? This or this? Hold your place online at inquicker.com and skip the ER waiting room. Ooh, is that hot, Coco? Oh, help yourself. on Healthy Living with Carrie Mal. Thank you for joining us. You are a nurse practitioner um, working with the Breast Center, which is really exciting. Yes. Let's talk a little bit, if we can, about um, your background. I want to talk a little bit about your background and also what a nurse practitioner does. Okay. Um, so I recently moved here from Phoenix, Arizona. Mm -hmm. I've been a nurse practitioner for about 10 years, this mm -hmm. is my 10th year, and prior to that I was a labor and delivery nurse. Oh, were you? Okay. Mm -hmm. So I've been working in high-risk OB and women's health since 2002 as and a nurse love it. I love it. Okay. And I really love specific populations, especially high-risk populations like women who have breast cancer. How did you end up coming here? Well, my family lives in the area okay. and we had been in Arizona for about 14 years and we were ready to come back near family. We have two young children, so we were happy to be by family. Oh, that's wonderful. You know, we hear and we talk about um, physician's assistants, nurse practitioners, physicians. I think there are a lot of titles floating around. Talk to us a little bit about the role of the nurse practitioner, first of all, and then your role in this breast center. Sure. Um, a nurse practitioner is essentially a nurse who's gone on past her basic training. Okay. Um, and for a nurse, when I'm talking about basic training, I'm talking about a bachelor's degree in nursing. So I went on and received my master's degree in nursing, and then I took a certification test that allowed me to be a nurse practitioner. And what can you actually do? What does that allow you to so, do? So uh, advanced assessment skills, I'm able to diagnose and evaluate and treat patients. I can write prescriptions. Mm -hmm. um, and I work closely with a physician to help them extend their care. Oh, that makes sense. To Very me. similar okay. to a physician assistant. Similar roles. Um, nurses function under their own license. That's what makes us a little bit different than. Oh, a physician I didn't realize assistant. that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, here at the Breast Care Center, what are the role? What's the role that you're playing, and sure. what are you actually doing on a day-to-day -day basis? Sure. So, Dr. Herman, our breast surgeon, um, she primarily focuses on cancer mm -hmm. and treating that cancer. So she does a lot. She spends a lot of time in surgery. Okay. And then from that point, I help her with her survivorship program. So women who've had breast cancer, we monitor them very closely after they've had cancer and they've survived. Mm -hmm. So that means um, frequent office visits, making sure they're getting their mammograms. Okay. And then also for patients who are high risk for breast cancer, it just means close surveillance. We watch them closely. We see them often. And we make sure they're getting the testing that they need to be done. And what does that actually look like in terms in practical application? If my sister had breast cancer and then I go, it puts me in a high risk category yes. as determined by? Yes, so there we know there are certain criteria that we follow as far as who's at higher risk. Okay. You mentioned one of them, family history. Okay. So somebody who has a family history and a female um, family member of, mm -hmm. of breast cancer, um, somebody in your family who's had ovarian cancer, if you've had a male family member who's had breast cancer, and then there are certain other categories. For example, if you've had multiple um, members of your family who have had cancer, but maybe they were your aunts or your cousins. Okay. Um, also people that have had frequent breast biopsies mm -hmm. and people that have certain types of breast tissue in their breasts. For example? Um, an example of that would be anything that's an atypical cell. So let's say we found a mass in your breast, we biopsied it, we found out that that was an atypical growing cell, then we watch you more closely for cancer. And what does watching you really entail? Good question. It asks, it, it, 
makes us do more frequent breast exams. So mm -hmm. we get to know your breasts and so we can pick up when there's a change. Mm -hmm. We always um, you know, teach our patients to do breast exams, but many women are uncomfortable doing breast exams because they're afraid of their breasts. Mm -hmm. We all hear about breast cancer and... Yeah, have, what if I find a lump? Exactly, mm -hmm. then what do I do and what does that mean? Does that mean I have cancer? And so what we do is teach you to get to know your breast. We get to know your breast because mm -hmm. there's much of what we feel that is normal. So mm -hmm. we just teach you that. And then also doing breast imaging. That might be mammograms. We okay. want you to at least get a yearly mammogram or... And do um, you use a baseline mammogram from a year ago, three years do. ago, five we years always ago? What compare. do you like? We, well, we want at least the last two years. Okay. So here at Hilton Head, what we like um, is for you to be seen by a breast radiologist. We mm -hmm. have one here. Mm -hmm. And a breast radiologist is special in that they are fellowship trained they just they just look at breast imaging of breasts. That's all they do is breast. It's because there's a from what I understand there's a lot of nuance. Mm -hmm. I mean it's it's there there are subtle changes that can actually be helpful in seeing and yes. diagnosing. Yes, because there are your breasts will start to act differently when cancer is coming or is there. Okay. So we might see subtle changes in it, and that breast radiologist could pick that up compared with somebody who doesn't look at breasts every day. And we have a digital mammography machine yes. here. Why yes. is that so so wonderful? Clear and better pictures, plus the views are better. So it just gives us a better all, overall picture. Mm -hmm. The other thing that we do here that other places don't do is we do breast ultrasound. So that's something that if we see something abnormal on a mammogram, we can go right to a breast ultrasound and have that all done here. Why is that so important and why is that so helpful from a proactive point of view? Because when you tell a woman she has an abnormal mammogram, right. she'll sit there and think, okay, I have cancer. Mm -hmm. you, Absolutely. You jump from the automatic, I have an abnormal, to jumping to cancer. Right. So if in the meantime we can say, okay, we found this abnormality, let's prove that it's actually normal, we can do that with additional imaging with an ultrasound instead of letting them wait for a few days to have that ultrasound and think that they have cancer that whole time. So it's, it's really a, um, an anxiety relief, if you yes. will. Because I, th I think that would be part of the tough, is just waiting for mm -hmm. results, waiting, waiting, mm -hmm. waiting. If, you are if your family member has breast cancer, is everyone then immediately considered high risk? No, not necessarily because... What do you look at? What are some criteria? Is there a scale that you go by? Is there a... We do. We use a, something called a Gale score. So okay. that is a mm -hmm. system where we enter in certain facts about you. Your age, okay. your rage, age. your race. Okay. Um, certain races are more predisposed to having cancer. African American, uh, Hispanic, yes, or, or Caucasian. Caucasian. Okay. Um, if you've had, who in your family has had breast cancer? Is it a first degree relative or is it, you know, we all have extended families, mm -hmm. you know, and if they're off, often step families, so figuring out who in your family had the cancer. I like this, it's the Gale scale. Yeah, Okay. the Gale okay. scale. And my then, age, my, okay. Yep. Um, and then what you've had done to your breast. So have you had breast biopsies done? That sort of thing. And then that will calculate a risk in a percentage for us and tell us if you're a high risk or not. Breast augmentations, any kind of surgeries have any impact at all on? Any breast surgery that can disrupt normal breast tissue could predispose you to breast changes, but if they, we can't say that it causes cancer or anything no, like that. I, well, no, no, that makes no. sense. Yeah, it's just, it's just disruption of the breast tissue. And then how often, when, how often do, and we're talking about the risk folks that are high risk, we're yes. gonna go and talk to, uh, yes. talk about the folks who have actually had yes. survivors next, but for the folks who are high risk, how often do you like to see them? We like to see them every six months. Okay. And we do breast imaging, so that mammogram or ultrasound or, or MRI, something like that, depend, it depends on that person, but at least once a year. At what point would you do um, ultrasounds or MRIs as opposed to um, just a mammogram? Good question. So usually we use mammogram for the screening. Mm -hmm. Often if that screening is abnormal, we can do a digital mammogram, so a diagnostic mammogram where we get more views. That's okay. essentially all that means, is you're okay. getting more views looking at the breast in different positions. Enhancements, if you will? Yes. Okay. Um, from that point, if there's something that we see, like a little mass, then we need to f figure out if that's um, something solid or if it's something full of liquid, like a cyst. So the ultrasound helps us do that. Ah. And it also helps with people that have very dense breasts. Mm -hmm. That's also what And MRI what does that helps. mean? I hear that term. Um, that's, it's, it's something that's very common and yet hard relatively to understand. If you think about our breasts, what our breasts do at, over time or as we age, our breasts, initially when we're young, are dense, 
They're full of tissue that is hormonally stimulated okay. and over time as we go through menopause and as we age, we start to replace that tissue with fat. Okay. So dense breasts just mean that you have not replaced that tissue with fat. Okay. They're still what we call busy breasts. Okay. So there's still lots of activity going on. Um, I love the names, don't you? It's like, okay. Yeah, uh -huh. busy breasts. Mm -hmm. So MRI and ultrasound help us look at those busy breasts a little bit more closely. So a lot of women have dense breasts. It doesn't mean there's anything wrong. It just means you bear watching. Are women more prone to breast cancer um, at certain or specific ages? Yes, typically breast cancer is an a, a, a disease of an older woman. That's when we would normally see it. And that goes along with most cancer. Um, when we see it in a younger age, we often think that there's a genetic link. And there's still lots of research being done on the, the genetics of breast cancer. We do have some information about it, but I think there's a lot more that will be coming. Carrie, we're going to take a quick break here on Healthy Living and come right back and talk a bit more about breast cancer and uh, breast care clinic and what you do. So stay with us. We'll be right back here on Healthy Living. We were outside after dinner, Mary Grace was riding her bike and heard a scream that no mother wants to hear. We took her immediately to Coastal Carolina. We could not believe it was a broken jaw. They are gifted to do what they do. And they are there for the community. And as a member of the community, I will be forever grateful. Hilton Head Regional Medical Center is located at 25 Hospital Center Boulevard. When traveling east on William Hilton Parkway, make a left-hand turn on Beach City Road, and the next left, Hospital Center Boulevard, will be located just past the Hilton Head Library. Coastal Carolina Hospital is located on US 278 at Exit 8 on I-95. Telephone is 843-784-8000 on the web www.coastalhospital.com. We went to the emergency room and thank heavens we did. They discovered that I had two totally blocked arteries and I ended up having double bypass open heart surgery. Well, I stayed in the hospital for just a few nights. To the staff at Hilton Head Hospital, I would express the deepest gratitude that I possess. They literally, quite literally, saved my wife's life. We are back here on Healthy Living. Once again, we're here with Carrie Mal. We're talking about nurse practitioners. We're also talking about, about the Breast Health Center mm -hmm. and um, your role and how it really works. During the break, it was really interesting for me to talk, to ask you the, the question, um, if I do not have breast cancer, mm -hmm. am I more likely to see Dr. Herman? Am I more likely to see you? Do you all have a, div a role division? Mm -hmm. How does all that work? The way I look at it is she and I are a partnership and mm -hmm. I just help her um, provide a care to a greater amount of people. Mm -hmm. So if you don't see her, it's, it's okay. It's a good thing. It's a good thing. Okay. <laughs> She's often doing surgery and then also taking care of those um, cancer patients. So you may not see her every time you come, but it's okay as I help her provide that care. I know one of the things that, that you all have always stressed is a collaborative kind of interdisciplinary yes. team and or multidisciplinary team, I think is the actual word. And so do you do a lot of collaborating? You'll meet and say, I saw Debbie or whomever. Yes. Ever, and here's what we decide. Yes, a couple really interesting things that we do that I find unique here are we meet with our radiologist once a week. We go over images okay. of patients that we're concerned about together. We did that just today. And that can be anywhere from about 15 to 20 patients. And then we look at their pathology, if they've had a biopsy mm -hmm. or if they've had cancer. And then we talk through those patients. You know, I think that would be really fascinating and probably allow the best um, diagnosis, diagnoses and treatment interventions because you all come from kind of different points mm -hmm. of view, different levels yes. of experience, different expertise. Yes. So even a patient who's high risk, somebody who's had just a biopsy, um, those patients are being looked at by a variety of different sets of eyes. 
during the first um, segment, we really talked about if you do not have breast cancer and you are in a high risk category, mm -hmm. what that looks like. Mm -hmm. Let's talk a little bit now about if you are diagnosed with breast cancer sure. um, or are a survivor, what, what are protocols for both of those and how do you um, interact within the breast center? Sure, um, first of all, everything we do will be very individualized. So if you are new to our center and you have been diagnosed with cancer, you'll meet with our team. Okay, um, we'll sit who down include? And talk. That will include Dr. Herman, June, our nurse. June Gamble, um, yeah, she's great. Yeah, she's wonderful, uh -huh. myself. And then often we have our other support team come in that would include Christy, who runs our front desk mm -hmm. and answers all your phone calls, and then Tracy, who does all of our surgery scheduling. So it's really, you're developing a relationship with it this. It is. It's a family. We work together as a family, and that's how we see providing the care is that we are providing care to our family members. Mm -hmm. So from that point, um, once we have your diagnosis, we take you to our tumor board, which is um, a team of physicians, including oncologists, a radiation oncologist, um, and then also plastic surgeons and the nurses to come up with the best treatment plan for And that's you. what we were talking about, that multidisciplinary yes. continuum of yes. care. Yes, okay. and then definitely our, our pathologists come to that as well. And mm -hmm. so that just gives a very comprehensive care structure for your, your cancer that we're And then what providing. can I expect? Um, are you my point person? Are you the leader? Are you sort of the team leader, if you will? That's a great question. June and I together do that. Um, June is the person who does a lot of the phone calls, the interactions with the patients. I see a lot of the patients in clinic, so we work on those things together. Um, and June, cancer is a, a very strong love of her, so she's really good at it. She also runs our support group okay. for now, cancer survivors. As a patient, what can I come prepared with as far as questions or information to make you, your job, mm -hmm. I don't want to say easier, but most effective? I think that to be efficient. Yeah, to be efficient, so exactly. I think it's important always to bring a family member. Um, having been diagnosed with cancer is a very emotional, hard thing to deal with. And okay. so having somebody there that might be able to clarify your thoughts or your questions or your concerns is important. So a family member or a close friend. I would or if I'm going la 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 yes. la as you're talking exactly. to me. Okay. Or if you're crying because yeah. it's very emotional. So I think it's important to have somebody there. Mm -hmm. And then I think it's important to write down a list of questions or concerns that you have so that you don't miss anything. You can ask any questions that you have. There are lots of myths, lots of things to be worried about. Well, so. and I was going to ask you that. I know that in this um, day and age of um, let me go on Google and find out. Mm -hmm. Do you help me um, really know where to go or where to stay away from? Can you yes. help me with websites so Definitely. that I can be informed as a patient, but but informed in a in a in the right way? Definitely. Um, first of all, when you come and you're diagnosed with cancer, you'll get a book. Okay. And the this book, is from you all. Yes. Okay. It's provided by the auxiliary here, and it's a wonderful book, and it walks you through your cancer care. But then also, we'll help you tell you which websites to go to, and that okay. will include the Komen Foundation and also the National Cancer Institute. So there's lots of good places to go to and some places that aren't so good to go to, and we'll help you figure out which So I've had my surgery, I've had my initial mm -hmm. intervention. Mm -hmm. Then do I come back and visit you? You do. We'll see you every three to four months. Okay. In addition to that, you will probably see a medication or a medical oncologist, mm -hmm. and you'll probably see a radiation oncologist. Mm -hmm. So you'll have lots of appointments, and there'll be lots of contact with you. But again, you are my team leader for yes. that. You are sort of my, my yes. point of contact. Yes, and so initially you'll see myself and Dr. Herman, and then eventually over time as you get farther and farther from your diagnosis you'll probably just see me. And then once you do, let's say it's three months post, uh, six mm -hmm. months, a year, mm -hmm. um, what happens then? I will come every three months. Again, armed with what kinds of questions? What could I expect? Um, questions that I would bring at that point are just basically how you're feeling, how you're recovering, um, mm -hmm. questions about activity, questions about how you're feeling about how you look. Quality of quality life Quality of life okay. things. Because that's, it will shift from a period of, am I going to survive this, to a period of how am I going to live with this and how am I going to go on. And then also questions that your family members will have. Because breast cancer makes everyone fearful, including your family members. And if you have daughters, if you have nieces, mm -hmm. often they have questions as well. Which makes a lot of sense to me. Husbands, mm -hmm. I'm sure everyone really wants to know. Mm -hmm. All right, so now we've been through the diagnosis. Time has slipped by, a year has gone by. Mm -hmm. What happens then, I heard you say survivorship, that mm -hmm. you, you work with survivors. Mm -hmm. What does that look like? And again, 
um, from a protocol or prevention point of view, what do we do? So <laughs> what do we do? How yes, do we, uh, we continue to see you often. Generally, we like to see you every three to four months for the first two years. Are we doing breast exams We're again? doing breast exams, okay. and depending on what you need, you, you still might be getting mammograms mm -hmm. um, or other breast imaging, ultrasounds, and MRI, just depending on the situation. And then from that point, after that, we see you every six months, and then we eventually will go to an annual follow-up. Do you view breast cancer in today's world as more of a chronic kind of condition that many, many of us, many women just in general, will kind of always have over their shoulder, if you will? It can be. You know, right now, the statistics are one in eight women in this country will have breast cancer. Um, so I think it, but we are surviving it longer. So I think it is something that you may carry with you for a period of time in your are life. Are there different kinds there of breast cancer? are different kinds of breast cancer. And cancers. different treatment interventions? Yes, there are, absolutely. So there's a range of breast cancer that you can have from um, a stage zero breast cancer, which just means it was contained within a cell to a very extensive um, breast cancer mm -hmm. that is everywhere. So it depends where you fall on that, on that spectrum of disease. Is that why, um, recommending yearly mammograms. I know, you know, it's funny, I read in the, in the, um, in the papers or here on the news occasionally the controversy about when is appropriate to have a mammogram, how often, what mm -hmm. are you all feel at the breast center? We still recommend every year to have a mammogram. Okay. We definitely do and we recommend it being done by somebody who knows breast, so a breast radiologist. At what age? Um, we would like, it depends again on your situation. For mm -hmm. example, if your mother had breast cancer then we would want to have you start having your mammograms 10 years before her breast cancer. So let's say she had breast cancer at age 40, then you would start at age 30. For All right, your okay, that makes sense. And then if you are someone who doesn't have that history, you'll get a baseline between 35 and 40, and then an annual breast an annual mammogram mm -hmm. every year after 40. And what are your thoughts? I, again, I've also heard talk about um, that self breast exams. Eh. But I, you know, we've always been raised, and I've heard, and mm -hmm. even from you, Dr. Mm -hmm. Herman, everyone that I've ever talked to said mm -hmm. that it's they're critical. They are. I believe they are because that's how you know your body. Simply just getting used to your tissue, what you feel like, that's going to help you pick up on something. No, you might not feel cancer, but you might feel something else. You might feel pain. You might see a change in your breast, like a simple blood vessel change or mm -hmm. skin change, and that's why they're so important. It's really interesting to talk like this. I think to take the emotion out of it and just talk um, mm -hmm. pretty much just kind of straight up, here's what we're talking about, mm -hmm. really makes it um, palpable to mm -hmm. even think about, frankly. Mm -hmm. Well, we really appreciate you coming. Thank you, well, thank Carrie, you. for joining us. We want thank to thank you. you all for joining us here on Healthy Living. Have a great day.